Coming up, it's the story behind one of the most recognizable music videos, or really songs, of the 80s, featuring a suave dress for success rocker and a stunning backup band who couldn't play a power chord to save their lives. I mean, it took a decade to get mainstream radio to notice this artist, but did they ever after this one? We're going to take a deep dive into this number one obsessive anthem that had everyone hooked from the moment they heard it. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you love the stories behind the songs, the soundtrack of your lives, subscribe below right now so that you can get to the history behind these songs and these albums straight from the artists. Now, before today's featured song ascended to number one on the charts in 86, Robert Palmer's solo career was, was barely treading water. There's no doubt that this clean cut dress to the nines rock and roll gent, he put in the work. In fact, he was tireless. He released eight solo albums in a decade's time. But commercial success remained really elusive at that point. Addicted to love would change everything. Robert Palmer's solo career started off with the 1974 release Sneak and Sally Through the Alley. Sneak and Sally through the alley. Peaked at number 107 on the Billboard 200. And the single Get Outside, that stalled at 105. Get outside. It'd take Robert five more albums before he would even make any noise on the Billboard Hot 100. That came in the form of uh, the 1978 number 16 reggae flavored Every Kind of People. Great song. Every kind of people. The next year, he followed that up with Moon Martin's Bad Case of Loving You, Dr. Doctor. Dr. Doctor, give me the news, I got a bad case of love. That reached number 14 in the US, seemed like he had some momentum. But really, that was about it, at least for here in the States. Over the next six years, Robert Palmer failed to score another U.S. Top 40 hit. Out of his first 20 singles, 11 failed to chart at all. The rest averaged about a number 71 ranking. Not exactly staggering numbers. Though Palmer had the, the, the talent, the, the work ethic, and the looks, and the voice, he was well on the fringes of the mainstream. Looking back on years of growing pains, Robert Palmer would say, my biggest problem is timing. An album that I made five years ago, Clues, is now considered mainstream, although when it was released over in America, it didn't do anything. Uh, I remember playing reggae music in Phoenix eight years ago and being booed off the stage. It's all the rage now. And later, Robert Palmer conceded, maybe I wasn't doing it right. Guess my stuff wasn't communicating properly or just wasn't broad enough. But despite reaping lackluster results for years, Robert Palmer was no quitter. Already hard at work on his 1985 album, Riptide, Robert was about to have a big stroke of luck. Two of the world's biggest pop stars reached out and said that they wanted to collaborate with him. John and Andy Taylor from Duran Duran were taking a break after releasing three Platinum Plus albums. Together with Chic drummer Tony Thompson, they formed a band that they had called The Power Station. Their initial plan was to showcase a number of guest singers on this album. Along with Palmer, uh, invitations were issued to Mick Jagger, uh, there was Billy Idol, there was Mick Ronson, Mars Williams, and uh, also Richard Butler of the Psychedelic Furs. However, Robert Palmer's audition tape impressed the Taylors more than the rest, and they offered him full-time lead singer status in this band. At least that's what the record claims. The partnership produced a one-off album featuring an eclectic mix of heavy guitar riffs, danceable funk, and polished pop. What else would you expect from a Palmer Duran chic collaboration? Now, the album was released on uh, March 25th of 85. It climbed to number 12 in the UK, and it went to number six. Here in the U.S. on the strength of three singles, Some Like It Hot. Some like it hot, so let's turn up the heat till we fry. T-Rex cover of uh, Get It On, Bang It Gong. Get it on, bang it gong, get it on. And communication. Oh, you know I can't get through. I communicate. 
Some Like It Hot, that reached number six on the Hot 100, Get It On rose to number nine, and Communication went to number 34, so all pretty big hits. Power Station proved to be a positive symbiotic relationship for all the parties involved. The Taylors brought Palmer some overdue press, and Robert gave the Wild Boys some veteran musical uh, credibility. Overall, the group's success was a pleasant surprise for Robert Palmer. But uh, when his ad hoc bandmates wanted to take the show on the road, that's where Robert Palmer declined. He wanted to finish Riptide instead, get that album out. It becomes clear just how much Robert actually influenced the Power Station sound when you give uh, Riptide a listen. Maybe it was the other way around, really. After all, Power Station members Tony Thompson, Andy Taylor, and producer Bernard Edwards, they all contributed to Riptide. I mean, Bernard Edwards came up with one of the greatest bass lines in pop music history. We've talked about it before and so many people copied it. Now, Palmer's signature smoothness is still in the music, but Duran Duran's power pop sensibility seemed to have rubbed off on him as well. It made for a, a, a collection of super slick, instantly appealing songs. Riptide was recorded at Compass Point Studios in the Bahamas over a three-month period from, I believe it was July to September of 85, and it was released later in November. Now, initially, it looked like Palmer's commercial prospects weren't going to change at all. Lead single, Discipline of Love, that only reached number 95 in the UK. When it did a little better here in the US, it went to 82. And the follow-up title track didn't even get released in America. In a but the losing streak finally came to an end in a huge way with the release of the third single, Addicted to Love. just a power-packed anthem about obsessive love, and it reached the top spot on the U.S. Hot 100 after a 13-week climb. It overtook Prince's kiss in the process, even. Addicted to Love also reached number one on the Billboard Top Rock Tracks chart and the Cashbox chart internationally. It went to number five in the UK, went to number four in Canada, Ireland, South Africa, went to number two in New Zealand, and it went to number one in Australia. It was an absolute worldwide smash. Now, as we dive into this no doubt about an 80s smash, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, my only choice for glasses. Uh, with summer winding down and back to school, it's around the corner, at least for the kids, uh, you can actually get new glasses and new frames for every member of your family starting at just $6.95 a pair. That's a price that can't be beat in current times. Check it out at zenny.com today. I mean, this was more than Robert Palmer could have ever hoped for. Addicted to Love was a, an absolute game changer. It would chart the course for the rest of his career, the rest of the 80s. The two other singles followed in the wake of Addicted to Love. There was Hyperactive and I Didn't Mean to Turn You On, uh, rising to, uh, I, was, I think it was number 33 and number two on the Hot 100, respectively. Palmer's 1987 follow-up, Heavy Nova, that produced two more U.S. Palmer hits, Early in the Morning and Simply Irresistible. After years of mixed success, Robert Palmer was finally on the map, thanks to Addicted to Love. Addicted was one of the earliest tracks uh, written for the album Riptide. And Robert knew he was on to something from the moment he sung the song's first notes, which actually happened to be in the middle of the night. Uh, Palmer said that he dreamed about the song, and then he woke up at like three in the morning to hum it into his tape recorder. Now, Palmer considered himself incredibly lucky because this actually wasn't the first time a song woke him up. A lot of times when that happens, he would say, it's just nonsense. But in the morning, I listened to it, and I knew I'd caught one. Originally, Robert Palmer envisioned Addicted to Love as a duet, or at least he did after meeting Shaka Khan at a club. I guess the two hit it off immediately, and Palmer was impressed. He said, she's one of the singers I've always wanted to sing with. Of course, I mean, Shaka Khan is incredible, one of the best singers uh, uh, of her time. 
the pair got to talking and uh, Robert Palmer invited the Soul Diva to sing on Addicted to Love. So they went to Palmer's studio, they cut a demo. Ashaka Khan would say, I arranged the vocals for his number one hit, Addicted to Love, but unfortunately the vocals I recorded didn't make the final version. I was still pretty stoked to have been involved in this project though. So yeah, the duet never saw the light of day. And this was because uh, Shaka Khan's managing team, they nixed the idea. At the time, she already had two songs that were climbing the charts and they were concerned that a side project with Robert Palmer would oversaturate the market. Still, Shaka Khan was accredited for the song's vocal arrangement. You remember also in that year, she hit number one as a featured guest on another love song, Higher Love, Steve Winwood. Other credits for Addicted to Love go to Power Station bandmates Andy Taylor and Tony Thompson. Taylor's lead guitar gave the song its, its ferocious, hardened edge. Tony Thompson turned in some stellar drum work, including that memorable opening solo. You can't forget that, one of the most recognizable ever. The rest of the sound was rounded with contributions from uh, Eddie Martinez and Wally Bataru, uh, who was on keyboards. Altogether, Palmer's team created a bombastic pop rocker that anyone who's ever fallen hard for that simply irresistible someone had to say it. Simply irresistible. Palmer doesn't pull any punches when telling the tale though. This girl is hopelessly infatuated with him and in a desperate need of a, a passionate love fix. She can't sleep, she can't eat, she can't even breathe. Another kiss is all she needs. Another kiss is all you need. Robert seeing the signs it seems like he has this, this love junkie in the palm of his hand. Your lights are on, but you're not home. Your mind is not your own. Your mind is not your own. Your heart sweats, your body shakes. Another kiss is what it takes. I mean, she is deep under the spell. There's no escape. She may think she's immune to the stuff. Palmer says otherwise. The truth is that, you know, she can't get enough, so she might as well face it. She's addicted to love. And after hearing that line 30 times throughout the song, we might as well face it that we're just as addicted to the hypnotic track. It's why it hit number one. It's really a brilliant stroke of songcraft. Hearing the word addicted repeated so many times not only hooks you, but it ultimately it seeps deep into your, your subconscious. Keeping you craving more, you know, long after the song is finished, especially the one track mind part. I love the vocals on that. The remainder of Addicted to Love doesn't really break new lyrical territory. It's pretty much the same message on repeat. Your heart beats in double time, another kiss and you'll be mine. Your heart beats in double time. Robert Palmer is one of the most underappreciated figures in all of music. He was, he was so suave. He was like the James Bond of pop music. But his vocals are more electric than his persona, which is saying a lot. Unlike the actors that played James Bond or play James Bond, Palmer does all of his own stunts. Singing, writing, and a visionary, which really brings us to the music video. Addicted to Love will always be remembered for its captivating music video. Front and center, we get Robert in his standard issued crisp Italian suit and his backup band, five pouting models who couldn't play an instrument to save their lives. The lights are on, but you're not home. It's a vision from the 80s that was copied time after time after time. Directed by Terrence Donovan, The video was inspired by the work of illustrator Patrick Nigel. Uh, he designed the cover for Duran Duran's Rio. He's talked about that a few weeks ago. For the shoot, Donovan hired five models ages 19 to 24. Now looking at the video from right to left, you have Julie Pankhurst on keyboards, Patty Kelly on guitar, 
Mark Gilchrist on bass, Julie Bellino on lead guitar, and Kathy Davies on drums. When we got to the set, said uh, Julie Bellino, the director told us each to pick an instrument. I happened to pick lead guitar. Then we went into hair and makeup, which took quite a long time, as you can imagine. The makeup was ladled on. I could barely talk because my lip gloss was so heavy. After choosing their instruments, the girls were instructed uh, to pretend to play. Of course, none of the girls were actually musicians, and that was part of the gimmick. Though they were given, uh, I guess, a quick lesson on how to fake it, really didn't make much of a difference. Now, the dancing it didn't come easy either. Throughout the video, the girls all seem to be moving to slightly different beats, none of which quite line up with the music. It works brilliantly. In their defense, Donovan did get them a little bit sloshed, as I understand, according to uh, Gilchrist. While she and the other girls were on lunch break, Donovan slammed a bottle of wine down on their table. Get your chops around that, is what he said. I got a little tipsy. In fact, I got rather drunk. After lunch, my ankles began to wobble in those heels. My ankles sort of clicked over and I lost my balance. The neck of my bass hit Robert Palmer in the back of the head and his head hit the microphone. That would have been a hilarious outtake. When the shoot was finished, the resulting footage had Palmer looking undeniably suave. For every 80s viewer, he was really ultimate ladies man. Like I said, the James Bond of pop music. The video no doubt made Robert Palmer a star. People were asking who is this sharp dressed man with the mysterious all girl backup band. I mean, the MTV generation just drank it in and Addicted to Love became a planetary sensation. Today, it's still one of the most enduring pop in images from the 80s. I think it was ranked the number three best music video of the 80s on the, the Decade End Countdown. The song and the video, however, weren't without detractors. In some corners, Addicted to Love provoked accusations of sexism and misogyny, but uh, they apparently missed the irony and humor in Robert Palmer's work. According to Palmer's power station bandmate John Taylor, Robert wasn't at all comfortable doing music videos, and Addicted to Love exemplified how he felt about it. It was a video commenting on himself. He's making fun of it. What about the girls? According to Gilchrist, uh, none of us felt we were being exploited in that video. That was a shock to me when people said the video was demeaning to women. I thought the opposite. I thought we looked strong and quite scary. And actually, outside of a few seconds here and there, go back and watch it again, Robert Palmer doesn't show a whole lot of emotion when he's lip syncing either. I mean, some have argued that it's uh, symbolic of addiction itself, you know, being in a trance. I don't know, I've heard a lot of theories. Well, of course, the concept for the video was too good to leave at one and done. Uh, Robert returned multiple times to this particular theme. You, read me you can find similar style performances in the videos for I Didn't Mean to Turn You On and Simply Irresistible. Simply Irresistible. And then Corporate America took the Addicted to Love concept to the next level. I mean, Palmer was hired to sing Simply Irresistible for Pepsi. Oh. In the Rock and Roll of Cola Wars of the late 80s, name checked by Billy Joel, We Didn't Start the Fire. And of course, that video was copied by so many people, so much in pop culture. Make of that what you will. All in all, I mean, Robert Palmer had mixed feelings about Addicted to Love's success. I mean, on the one hand, he was happy that his hard work had unexpectedly paid off. He said, I'm not somebody who started in a garage six months ago and MTV put me up there. Uh, this is much more delicious. It almost feels like I'm getting away with something. It's all fallen into place perfectly. Kind of a nice accident. But on the other hand, Robert Palmer would become almost exclusively associated with the Addicted to Love music video and its successors, really. Well, 
And for an artist as diverse and prolific as, as Robert Palmer was, disappointment, really. The lights are on. I guess that's the price of becoming a worldwide phenomenon. Robert Palmer raked in multiple awards for Addicted to Love, including an MTV Video Music Award for Best Male Video in 86 and a Grammy for Best Male Rock Vocal, I believe, performance in 87. What? And that's when those awards mattered. Addicted to Love has appeared in a lot of movies and TV shows over the years. It was in the A-Team, it was in Simon & Simon, it was in Cocktail in 88. Beverly Hills 90210, Doogie Howser. I wish I was addicted to love. So Romy and Michelle's high school reunion in 97. The movie Addicted to Love in 97. What to expect when you're expecting Glee. Your on, but you're not home. You're Welcome to Marwen. Addicted to Love has also been covered by Van Halen. I know, I like the piano player myself. Johnny Cash, Florence and the Machine. Garth Brooks, Culture Club, Kelly Clarkson. Tony Hadley and Go West also performed it together on multiple occasions. Most notably, Tina Turner also covered Addicted to Love, and she incorporated it into her set list for her private dance room Break Every Rule tours. It was also released as a single off her 1988 double live album, Tina Live in Europe. This was one of those songs, Addicted to Love that at first listen, I was hooked. I remember recording it off the radio the first time it came on Casey Kasem's American Top 40. I was quick with recording it. I was singing along to it two minutes in. It was one of those musical punches in the face where I went out and I, I remember doing a bunch of chores for my dad to get the money to go buy the record immediately. I even remember uh, me and some neighborhood kids staging an exact reenactment of the music video one afternoon, we were bored in the summer. In fact, we filmed it with my friend's parents' uh, new video camera, and we got in big trouble because we recorded over his family's uh, vacation footage. Oh, yeah. And I remember our school did this uh, really cheesy remake as a campaign for Just Say No to Drugs. They were playing it, and we were all seeing the real lyrics, and we drowned out those teachers who thought they were pretty clever with their lyrics, but we, we had to sing the real thing. Robert Palmer was uh, pretty quiet. He was a really private person. He saw through the excess of a rock and roll style and he chose his project carefully. Robert Palmer passed away too soon, at just 54, of a sudden heart attack. You know, it wasn't a death that was plastered all over the news, but we, the children of the 80s, we felt it. We were all addicted to his music. Leave us a comment about Addicted to Love. What did you think of the music video when you first saw it? It was just one of the most iconic videos of the 80s. Let us know in the comments below uh, your take on the song and on Robert Palmer. Just so underappreciated. Uh, if you'll take a second, hit the subscribe button. That way you'll never miss out on any of our daily videos. We'd love to have you as part of this community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.